Right, so I call everyone. Oh, microphone. Um, <laughs> sorry, I always get excited about tech. Um, welcome to a new week at the Islamic Society meetings. I hope you've all been well. Um, I'm going to hand over to Joseph very quickly, where he'll tell you exactly who's coming to speak and why. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm really happy to introduce to you Dr. Joshua Ralston. He's the new lecturer. He's new to Edinburgh. He came to Edinburgh last September. Um, he's a new lecturer in Muslim Christian relations over at New College School of Divinity. Um, he's a Christian theologian that's specializing on Islamic studies, specifically Kalam and Fiqh and Sharia. I think he did his PhD at Emory University in America, where he focused on Christian understandings of Sharia. Um, He's spoken widely and he's written widely on issues related to Christian Muslim relations recently on um, on the Wheaton affair in America. I don't know if you know about the Christian professor who started wearing a hijab and then she she was about to get fired for it. I don't know if she actually got fired about it. Uh, Dr. Rosson spoke on that and also um, on Islamophobia and Charlie ha on Paris attacks and many other matters. Um, so. Today he'll be talking about mutual misunderstandings between, between Christians and Muslims. I think he'll be talking for about 30 minutes and then we'll open it for a Q&A. So please get some questions ready. Can you welcome Joshua with me? Thank you. Um, thank you to Joe, Joseph, Yusuf, uh, as I've begun calling him. And to all of you, uh, this is my first time being here and my first time really interacting uh, with the uh, British Muslims, which uh, Joe tells me just because I think that I know the Muslim societies in the United States or in Palestine or Egypt where I used to live, that British Muslims have a lot to teach me. So I'm looking forward to interacting with you and hopefully uh, we can continue to interact in other ways. Uh, all I want to do today is sort of sketch really, really briefly some of the ways that Christians and Muslims, now we're talking about at least four billion people, we're talking about 1,400 years, um, have misunderstood one another on some key issues, both of theology and ethics. And that's just to really get us going, to start talking, and hopefully in the Q&A we can sort of unpack those a lot more deeply. I want to start the conversation uh, in Egypt. I'm going to end it in Egypt as well, because these two experiences that I have have really profoundly shaped how I understand Christian-Muslim relations and encounter. And there are two poles that I try to actually avoid in how I think about uh, Christians and Muslims. It was a Wednesday night. I know it was Wednesday because it was Christian Ash Wednesday, which is a day that starts uh, preparation, Christian preparation for the celebration of Easter. I was living in Cairo uh, in 2011. If you know anything about what happened in Cairo in 2011, it was a quite a tense time, but it was actually quite an exciting time because unlike uh, maybe the situation right now, there is a lot of hope and optimism that the Egyptian situation would change and transform. But there was also sort of creeping fears of what was going to happen now that Mubarak was out of power. I had just finished lecturing in a class that I was teaching to a bunch of Protestant Arab Christians. There's about a half a million of them. Uh, on Christian-Muslim relations, there was nine Egyptians, one Syrian, and two Muslims from Al-Azhar. And I got in my cab trying to rush to church uh, for our Ash Wednesday service, and we had to pass through this neighborhood uh, called, uh, called the Mukattam, where on the top is a large Christian neighborhood that's primarily poor, and on the bottom is a large Muslim neighborhood that's also primarily poor. Uh, my Arabic uh, wasn't that great, and I was trying to figure out what was happening. There was a traffic jam, but this wasn't abnormal in Cairo, if anyone's ever been there. There's always traffic in Cairo. But then I started hearing helicopters, three, four, five, six, above us. And then I started hearing gunshots. And it turned out that I had been stuck in a traffic jam uh, because a clash had developed between Christians and Muslims that we found out the next morning had left nine Christians dead, including a church burnt, and six Muslims. It was this clash uh, that seemed so indicative of how Christians and Muslims have thought to understand themselves so many times throughout history. This is a picture of the conquest of what is now Istanbul or Constantinople. And I'm sure on the top of your heads, you can think of tons of examples of Christians and Muslims clashing with one another. Can anyone name a few that just comes to mind in history? Crusades. Crusades. 
both the Crusades in the Levant, but also the Reconquista in southern Spain, right, where Christian armies took back over southern Spain, Christian armies from the west went into uh, the, what is now Israel and Palestine. Any other examples? What? Yeah. Anything else? People want to speak? No? Right, so you think of the Crusades often. Uh, for some Christians, you think of the early conquests of places like Damascus and Jerusalem that were once Christian cities. You think of um, the ways, especially as an American, uh, my political rhetoric is framing Muslims today, especially as the run-up to the election. You think of sort of the passive critiques um, that some government here will say, you know, we're a Christian nation, at least in history. So this idea of confrontation seems to be really dominant in a lot of people's understanding of Christian-Muslim encounter. What was really interesting for me was that five days earlier, I had actually been in Tahrir Square for a celebration that brought together Coptic Christians and Muslims in Egypt to protest against rising sectarianism. There were Muslims from Al-Azhar, there were Salafists, uh, there was the Brotherhood, there were Coptic Christians, which there's about 8 million Christians in Egypt. It's one of the largest uh, Christian, po is the largest Christian population in the Arab world. And they joined hands, uh, I'm going to fast forward, they joined hands together in Tahrir Square to protest against rising sectarian violence. This is a picture that a good friend of mine took. Right, where you have the quintessential sheikh uh, with the beard, and you have the Coptic Christian. And they were actually joining hands together, chanting, Muslims and Christians, we are of one hand, which was actually a riff off one of the protests at Tahrir earlier. And here you had Christians and Muslims holding hands, not saying that they were the same, not denying that there were differences, but also trying to work together to think about Christian-Muslim relations in a way that didn't fall victim to the sort of confrontations that so often dominate uh, political discourse, academic discourse, and sometimes the discussions that we have in mosques or in churches. What was interesting is that there's a much longer history, a quieter one, of examples of historical times in which Christians and Muslims actually learn together from one another. Can anyone guess what this picture is? I'm going to make Professor Siddiqui answer because she probably is the only one in the room that knows. Can anyone guess what this might be? People are trying to read the Arabic. It, it's, a, it's an image that's um, taken from the book called The Church in the Shadow of the Mosque, which tells the story of Christian-Muslim engagement during especially the Abbasid period, right? So the high medieval period of, of Islam where Christians, Muslims, Jews got together actually in the court, and unlike uh, what's going on in Mosul today, debated theology and philosophy. It wasn't one of total equality, but it was one of mutual learning. Similar things have happened at other times and places, maybe even here for you all at the University of Edinburgh. Um, but I think this story of engagement between Christians and Muslims often gets lost in these broader misunderstandings. And especially in the current context of our day, where uh, many Christians, uh, I speak here of Western Christians, feel worried about the loss of power, right? Like Christians are used to being in power in Britain. Uh, Christians are used to being in power in the United States. And in the face of the loss of power, there's a tendency to, to blame the other. And um, as I'm sure some of you know, or some of you may have been experienced, often this falls on Muslims, especially in the West. You have this sense in which Muslims need to apologize for every action that happens in Paris or in Baghdad or in Mosul, right? And you have this habit, especially amongst Western Christians, of uh, often blaming Muslims and asking Muslims to speak for all acts of terror. Similarly, there are Arab Christians especially, but also Christians in Malaysia, in the Philippines, who feel similarly um, marginalized, that they're no longer able to use the word for God that they've traditionally used, or they're no longer, in the case of Mosul, allowed to worship publicly 
even though they had been worshiping there um, before the rise of Islam, during uh, the rule of Omar and early, uh, other early caliphs. And one of the problems, uh, I think, is that we, and this is really stereotypical, you could never get away with this in an academic paper, is that we have developed uh, as really large communities, right? Big communities that are pretty self-sufficient uh, of not actually interacting with one another and continuing to tell stories about the other person that may not be the way that the other tradition would understand themselves. So Christians, I'll here speak as one, uh, explain what Muslims believe or do in our own communities in a way that's not actually representative of the vast swath of Muslims. And similarly, I'm going to gesture since I have examples of it, that a similar problem maybe exists in the Muslim community. Right? Um, there's uh, one of the Ten Commandments, uh, which are in the, the, the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, talks about not bearing false witness against your neighbor. I think this is true not simply of not bearing false witness uh, in a law court, but also in the ways that we talk about other traditions. So one way that we might move past this history of, con of confrontation is at the very least learning to give an honest account of what the other community does, thinks, believes, prays, right? And begin to let the other community speak for themselves. Uh, your, your own tradition has this, uh, you know, located centrally in the ways in which Muslims are implored uh, in the Quran to also not bear false witness against Christians, but to actually debate with us uh, and, and the people of the book, the Ahl al-Kitab, in the way that is best, right? To take what is best in the other tradition and to engage with them. Uh, as you can tell, I didn't actually translate the Arabic term as Muslim. If you go, if you, if you know from uh, Surat al-Ankabut, if you know this uh, ayah, it's actually a little unclear what the word means, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? Right? Because it's, it's saying, our God and your God is one, and we are all Muslimun, which is just the plural for Muslim. And in one way, you could say, well, we're all Muslims. But in another sense, that doesn't seem to be the, the right, right way to read this, because it's talking about how Christians and Muslims and Jews have disagreements. But despite those disagreements, uh, we are all still Muslimun. We are all those who still submit to God's will. We can get into the tafsir later, but anyway. So that was sort of an overview. But what are some of the recurring misunderstandings that Christians and Muslims have of one another? And maybe these are, are not the ones you see, and I'd be happy to hear more from all of you. Um, but I think there's a few that I found when I talk to churches that continually come up that they ask about Muslims. And similarly, at least in the American context, uh, what many Muslims misunderstand about Christians. I think the first thing, and this one uh, is pretty complicated, is whether or not Christians really believe in one God or not, right? Whether or not we Christians really follow through on Tawheed, or whether we actually compromise the unity of God by worshiping three gods. Um, Christians, we are quite adamant that we don't. I'll get, we can talk in the Q&A about why that's the case. But often, uh, I find myself having to defend myself on this point. This here is uh, something that I got at the venerable institution of Al-Azhar in Cairo, right? One of the most learned institutions in the history of Islam. I was there in 2007 visiting, and uh, someone ran and gave me this tract you know what tract means? Is this an American word? Right? It's, it's a word for like uh, religious things that people hand out to people to convince them that their religion is right. And in it is a whole host of um, statements about the wrong things that Christians believe, right? How Christians are wrong about Jesus, how Christians are wrong about, uh, about the scriptures. Uh, and in it, there's the claim that Christians worship three gods the Father, Son, and the Spirit. Uh, but as we can talk about in the Q&A, most Christians, are, all Christians, are quite adamant that they only worship the one God, the creator of all that is. Now, how we come to understand that is different than Muslims. So I'm not saying that we all agree, but I think one of the ways that uh, the Muslim community 
uh, could improve relations is to, to be more consistent in both following through what the Quran itself says, um, but also to begin to understand what Christians mean and don't mean when we say that we believe in the Father, Son, and the Spirit. I can talk about that in the Q&A. Um, I'm not going to run through all of these, but one of the biggest things that I think Christians misunderstand about Muslims is the place of Muhammad. For Christians, it's really hard for Christians to understand the, the draw and appeal of the Prophet Muhammad, especially around his political action. So if you know, Christians believe, I know most Muslims don't, that when Jesus goes to Jerusalem, uh, he's confronted by the powers and he's crucified. And for Christians, this is a saving act of God. It shows Jesus' submission to God, even to the point of death, and it also shows God's love to us. So in the Christian sort of imagination, there's this real emphasis on sacrifice, on giving up oneself. When you have the option for political power, you turn it away. Obviously, uh, especially in the early uh, uh, prophethood of Muhammad, right, the first five to six to seven, eight, nine, ten years of his life and ministry in Medina after he started to receive the revelations from God, he is persecuted. His, he's attacked. Uh, he's marginalized. He's rejected by the people, right? But uh, ultimately, through whatever reasons, he ends up in Medina with the community on the Hijra and establishes an ummah, right? An ummah in Medina that establishes God's law. For Christians, we have a really hard time understanding why this is appealing to Muslims. Uh, because for many Christians, there's a recurring sense that uh, Muhammad cho chose political power over religious duty. Okay. Now, uh, one of the things that really opened my eyes to how Muslims begin to understand this um, was actually a text by a former professor at the University of Chicago. He's a Muslim. And he talks about the sort of um, Christian romanticism about God. That, that Christians have all of these sort of high-floating ideals about love and about justice um, that we sort of expect to not really happen in the world. And what we misunderstand about Muhammad is that actually, by going to Medina, by beginning to establish in complicated ways uh, a new community, Muhammad is actually trying to live God's justice and God's righteousness and God's commands in the real world, not in a sort of idealized world. And in a real world, that means um, dealing with people's disagreements, dealing with issues of marriage, dealing with issues of property, right? Christians tend to talk about law in very high-floating ethical ways. Do justice, love mercy, take care of the poor. One of the things that Muhammad's... Uh, ministry, especially in Medina shows, and the whole issue of Sharia, which is another thing Christians misunderstand, is that to talk about justice just idealistically doesn't really get us anywhere, right? It actually needs to be enacted in the real world we live in. So I, I, we can talk a lot more about these various things, but I think one of the recurring things that Christians misunderstand about, about Muslims ultimately re revolves around Muhammad's, uh, especially his work in Medina and the issue of Sharia what it is and what it isn't. And on the Muslim side, I think a lot of times you all misunderstand what we understand in terms of Jesus' own life and God's own oneness, right? Is that clear, sort of? We can talk about this more. Um, so I'll end with this. One of the things that bothers me a little bit about the conciliation model that we talked about before, the it, and a lot of ways that maybe you hear people talking uh, in the streets, or maybe this is just the American liberal Christian streets, is, you know, why can't we just get along? Why don't we just, uh, you know, uh, not talk about these things about politics or theology? Why don't we just all sort of do our own thing? Um, is that that actually isn't true to who you all are or who I am, right? All of you have been shaped and formed uh, in the communities that you're from. You believe deeply in, uh, in the Qur'an, in God's oneness, in the call to prayer, uh, in the hadith and the sunnah, and trying to live in accordance with that, right? That's shaped who you are. In a similar way that for Christians, we've been shaped and formed by our claims about what God is like, about practices of prayer, 
about the, I, the, about the claim to follow Jesus, especially following Jesus to the cross. These have fundamentally shaped us. And in one way, those things could lead to those sort of confrontations that we talked about. Uh, as uh, the Quran itself says, in, uh, that God has in fact revealed to Christians, handed down, inzil, right, to Christians the gospel, to, to Jews the Torah, to Muslims the Quran. Um, and in fact, it says that we will disagree and continue to disagree our whole lives. I'm thinking here of, I'm not going to be able to quote it. Yeah, you want to quote it in Arabic? Come on. Right. So we will get, so I'll read it in English. God has revealed to you what God has revealed, and do not fall on the inclination of those Okay, to each of you we have pres prescribed a law and a method. Had God willed, he could have made you one ummah, united in one deen, right, in one religion. But God intended to test you in all that was good, right? So race to all that is good. To God you will return, and God will inform you about the things you disagree about. This is one of my favorite ayah, right? God will race to what is good. It's not saying we don't disagree. It's not saying there aren't real issues between Christians and Muslims. But it's, and it's not saying just pretend those issues don't exist. Ignore them. Pretend that it doesn't matter what you believe about Muhammad or what we believe about Jesus, what you believe about the Quran or Sharia, right? It says actually those things matter, but disagree well. And disagree as you race to all that is good. Because we've all come from God and we will return to God and God will sort of make right what we haven't been able to understand. I think this sort of image, this vision that the Quran lays out of how we might disagree well is something that could go a long way to addressing some of the mutual misunderstandings that I've tried to sketch out today. But I'd rather hear what you guys all say and not just keep talking. This is a picture from Lebanon, by the way. Uh, Professor Siddiqui and I were there in December, and we tr I tried to get this picture myself, but because of the protests, I don't know if you know this, there's these trash protests, so they had like locked down all of the downtown Beirut, so we couldn't get into any of the mosques or any of the churches that are all like 1,500 years old. All we could get into were like Prada stores, which was kind of disappointing. Like I didn't go to Lebanon to go to a Prada store. I could have done that like over there in Newtown, but so... Don't go to Beirut until they clear out that situation. Anyway, on that note, uh, any questions about anything that I've talked about? I'm, I'm happy to sort of speak for all, mil all billion Christians, too. So I know that was really uh, a, a wide sketch, but if there's anything you want me to unpack or any, like, question you've always wanted to ask a Christian. And you can it can be mean too. I'm fine with it. Hear what my kids say about me. Yeah. So Christians believe that there is only one God, right? They follow the Jewish um, text that says it's central. Um, that there is only one God, right? That God alone is God and do not have any other idols. Don't mix anyone with God. Essentially, don't be guilty of shirk, right? Which is, it's a, a central commandment of the Old Testament. And Christians, Old Testament is the language Christians use for the Torah or the Hebrew Bible. The Old Testament is quite clear about that. And so Christians, on the one hand, want to maintain that. On the other hand, and this is where it gets really complicated, and you guys are all happy to come to class next year on Christian Muslim relations in the Divinity School that we're teaching. Uh, Christians came to think that God had not just sent a prophet or sent a messenger or sent some information about God in Jesus, but that God had somehow made God's self fully known in Jesus, right? Does that, does that make some sense? And so Christians had to figure out, how is God really, really present in Jesus, 
And how is uh, God also just one? And so, long story short, they develop a really complex way of talking, of saying that God is one in nature, right? God is only one in God's justice and God's goodness and God's holiness. God is only one personality. But that God um, exists in this oneness in three particular ways. As the not, I won't use Father, Son, and Spirit language because that sounds like God had a baby, right? That's not what Christians believe. Like I know, I used to live in Ramallah for two years and uh, there was like a big sign outside of, the, uh, outside of Nazareth uh, where Christians say, you know, Jesus grew up that essentially said, you know, desist, stop saying three, you know this. That's not actually what Christians believe. We don't believe that God, the Father, had a baby, right? What they say is that this one God eternally exists in three distinct modalities, right? As the source, as the word, and as the spirit. But these three are always one. So it's not like uh, the Father and the Son and the Spirit are trying to decide where to go to dinner, and the Father's like, hey, let's go, you know, let's go get some Indian food, and the Son's like, no, I want some hummus, and the Spirit's like, now I want a hamburger. That's not how they think of it. What they're saying is this one God, right, this one God, eternally exists in these three modes. I know it's pretty complicated. If you ask most Christians, we have no idea what we're talking about. Really, I mean, uh, but the idea is that, that this one God is somehow fully there in all three manifestations. That might get me called a modalist, but... Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that politics exacerbate these theological ideas, but the, the reality is, is that theology and politics never are these easily separated categories. So um, in Palestine, Christians and Muslims get along really pretty well, um, probably better than almost anywhere else. But one of the reasons they get along so well is that they have a shared uh, political enemy, right? They both are against um, the Israeli occupation, right? But the politics of Lebanon, similar things happen where Christians, Muslims, Druze used to exist pretty well, uh, but since 1975 have been at conflict. And I think one of the things that's really interesting about this is the ways in which some of the ways that Christians have talked about Muslims for a very long time in the West um, are getting sort of recalled by politicians or by bishops or by right-wing um, commentators, right? So if you actually look 500 years ago uh, when the Ottoman Empire was sort of making advances towards Austria, there was a lot of texts that bishops wrote, that Martin Luther wrote, about sort of an Ottoman invasion of Vienna, a uh, language of sort of the Muslims coming, and these same sort of tropes, these same sort of rhetoric are often used right now in terms of the migration crisis. Or um, some of the cartoons of Muhammad that were published in Denmark um, or with Charlie Hebdo, a lot of these images of Muhammad as violent or Muhammad as um, too sexual are similar images that Christians have used in their own debates. Right? So I think what's interesting is that oftentimes the theology gets sort of employed to further exacerbate political tensions. And I know, I mean, I know m many, compared to like Christians in Palestine or, or Jordan, who are very clear, we're Arab. Most Coptic Christians want to distinguish, yeah, we speak Arabic, but we're not Arab in the same way you are. So that's a whole nother long story. Well, there's a whole wide range, right? So um, Christians don't believe the same, most Christians don't believe the same thing about the Bible as Muslims believe about the Quran, right? We don't believe that God literally dictated it, right? God didn't tell Paul Ikra, right? God didn't uh, tell Moses, right? So Christians have, from the beginning, recognized that the, the Bible has sort of a, at least a thousand year sort of history. Um, some 
but Christians still want to say that despite the fact that the personality of each author, the culture of each author is present in the Bible, that God nonetheless is the inspirer of the Bible, right? So Christians, almost all of them, there's a few exceptions, are quite fine to say things like um, the letter that Paul wrote to Romans or the gospel that, that Luke wrote, right? That's, a, a Muslim never says the Quran that Muhammad wrote, right? That's not, I think that's another difference. Um, I've talked about this in other places. The Bible and the Quran are actually not as similar in the ways that Christians and Muslims practice as Jesus and the Quran, right? Jesus is the one that Christians say is the word of God, right? So, do, so does the Quran, Kalamatu Allah, right? It is the word of God. It is the one that is eternally with God. It's the eternal, Jesus is, for Christians, the eternal speech of God. It's always present with God. But at one time and place, it becomes historical. Right? Similarly, uh, for the traditional, uh, at least Asherite position of most Sunni Muslims, the Quran is eternally with God, right? Eternally was in God. It's not created. But at one time and place, it becomes sort of an Arabic book. Does that make sense? So Christians actually don't believe the same things about the Bible as Muslims do about the Quran. We still say it's the word of God, but we don't mean it in the same way that you all do. Does that help? And I think another, I mean, another thing, right? In the Quran, it constantly talks about Jesus, that God hands to Jesus the gospel, right? The, the gospel, the Injil, is given uh, through Jesus. For Christians, this is not how we understand it. We understand Jesus himself as the gospel. Jesus doesn't come with a book. Jesus is the gospel. Does that, I mean, so there's some ways that, I mean, that gets us into theology, but that's what I do. Anything else? Other questions? Uh, just simple questions. What do Christians think about this? Can you explain that? Muslims have an advantage on this point because you all came after Christians, right? So you have a, a text um, that is revealed after Christianity, and so it's able to include what we know as Christians, right? Um, Christians don't have any explicit mention of Muslims in our text. I mean, you can try to find a way to say that Ishmael, Ishmael is related to the Muslims. Some people have said that, but there's nothing about Muslims in, explicitly. Um, and one of the other things is, is that one of the things that makes Christian, Muslim, and Jewish relations really hard is that we sh is actually that we share a lot of stuff. So you've probably heard Abrahamic religions, right? The phrase that we all have Abraham or Ibrahim. That's an interesting and helpful starting place. But it's actually also a big problem. Go to Hebron. Has anyone ever been to Hebron? It, do you know where Hebron is? It's in the West Bank, Palestine. It's where um, Sarah and Abraham are said, Al-Khalil, are said to be buried. And what you have there is actually a, a mosque that's split in half. One side is Muslim, the other side is Jewish, and in the middle is Abraham's tomb. It's actually quite a symbol of the way that Abraham is both claimed by Muslims and Christians and Jews, which could be a point of agreement, but it also can be a point of disagreement, right? Because what Abraham means to us isn't what he means to you, and it isn't what it means to Jews. Now, what was your original question? Okay, right, right. So Christians don't, so w which is to say, while we have some shared overlapping story, shared overlapping narratives, Musa, Ibrahim, uh, Jesus, Joseph, um, Sarah and Hagar, we disagree about what those mean. Um, but Christians, one of the, the problems is for Christians is that um, they're used to being the winners, the last ones, right? And so it's really hard for Christians to begin to understand Islam because for Christians, just like for Muslims, God's final word is spoken in Jesus. You want to know what God says? For a Christian, you look at Jesus. 
Jesus is the Forkan. Is that right pronunciation? Yeah. Got me all nervous. Uh, Joe's looking at my Arabic. Uh, Joseph. Okay, right? So for us, well, so it doesn't make, for Christians, it doesn't make a ton of sense. Well, if you have the whole thing, why do you need something else? Similarly, for Muslims, right, if you have the whole thing, if you have God's final word, if you have God's final sort of check on, on everything, you don't need anything else. So the idea of other revelations, I won't name uh, groups that you guys may think are problems, right? So I think that's one of the tensions. Um, Christians have had a whole ways, different ways of thinking about Muslims throughout our history, most of them pretty negative. Um, but what's interesting is that Muslims put Christians in the same position that Christians have put Muslim, uh, Jews, right? To say, we've got something after you. Is that? But in terms of the battle for heaven, um, yeah, that's a whole long story, but I, I'm not going to speak to all of it. But I think um, the fact that there's no explicit mention of Muslims within our text makes it both hard and actually freeing, right? Because I don't have to pretend that I have to go find something. Um, but in terms of with Judaism, we have this long, Christians have this really long clash. So it's about reinterpreting long-standing interpretations, while with Muslims it's looking for new ones. Does that help at all? So historically, Christians have had really negative things to say about Muhammad. And I think that's one of the things Christians need to address. Um, so the first and primary way is to say that it's a false prophet. Or that Muhammad uh, cribbed. Everyone's looking at me. I'm not saying I believe this. I'm, I'm, I'm reporting. So one of the, th one of the recurring uh, polemics right, that Christians use is that Muhammad, when he was a traitor, right, going back and forth between Mecca and S Damascus, Syria. He met, like, a monk. This is the first time I've ever been talking about Christian Muslim dialogue and heard a bagpipe. <laughs> Are we going to have halal haggis afterwards? Um, right, so the, fir the primary way has been that he's a false prophet or that he stole all these ideas from Christians. Um, some early Christians um, were not so negative, and they said, well, God actually did send, send Muhammad to the Arabs because the Arabs had never had a revelation in their own language. And so God did send Muhammad. God really did reveal true knowledge through Muhammad, but it was just for the Arabs. It wasn't for the whole world. Um, this is Paul of Cyprus, who's a uh, medieval Christian. So he tries to say that. Like, we can't say he's the final prophet. Um, but we can say that he really was a minor prophet, right? Um, more recently, Christian theologians have tried to, a whole host of ways to try to begin thinking about this. Um, one of the issues is that the word prophet means really different things for us and for Jews than it does for Muslims. And so in a Christian interpretation of the word prophet, someone who speaks God's word, someone who does justice for the sake of the oppressed, someone who calls people back to the oneness of God, right? Muhammad does all those things. Muhammad speaks the word of God. Muhammad uh, calls people to worship of the one God. Muhammad does justice for the sake of the oppressed. Uh, on those terms, some Christians are saying, well, we can affirm Muhammad is a prophet, but even when we do, we don't mean it the same way that a Muslim would when they, when they would say Muhammad Rasulullah, right? Because I think that... Christians are fine saying the first part of the shahada. It's the second part. Even if we would say it, we don't mean it in the same way that a Muslim does. Is that helpful? I mean, that's what you're throwing me to? Um. So, Christians eat pork. <laughs> if you've noticed. Uh, okay, so... I, so one of, the, one, of the, one of the recurring Muslim critiques of Christians is that God showed God's law and 
Christians didn't want to obey it, and so they made up their own ways of doing things, right? So, um, and food is one of the main ways that this is talked about. Uh, for cri- early Christians were Jews, so they, the men were all circumcised. They followed dietary rules, so they wouldn't eat pork. Uh, they wouldn't eat shellfish. Um, but as Christianity began to expand in the early, you know, at the turn of the millennium Western time, uh, you got more and more people who were not Jews who were wanting to be part of this Jesus movement. And long story short, but the Bible itself, as we have it, we can talk about this later, um, tells a story that essentially says if the Jewish believers can still obey the laws, but the Gentile believers, those who are not, don't have to start following Jewish law. So that's how they came to believe this. Um, there's a story of God sending a vision um, where there's a sort of a sheet coming down from heaven to Peter, and on it there are all the animals of the earth, and God says to Peter, well, what I make clean, don't make unclean. So essentially, you're able to eat whatever you want. Now, this is a big point of disagreement, but for Christians, um, dietary practices have not been a central part of our legal practice, which is confusing to both Jews and to Muslims. In terms of the hijab, um, in the Bible itself, does anyone know what it says when women are supposed to go pray? Paul, yeah, so there's some letters from Paul that actually say women are supposed to cover their heads when they go pray. Has anyone ever been to a church during the church service, not just into St. Giles because it was raining outside and you needed to wait for the bus to come? Or is that just me? Yeah, so Christians um, originally uh, uh, would actually separate, not originally, but er, much of... If you were to pull the majority of Christians throughout time and space, bring them back from the dead and ask them, the vast majority of times women would cover their heads when they prayed, but not necessarily all the time. And men and women would sit on different sides of the church. It's still the case in many uh, Christian traditions. Uh, In the West, that has slowly gone away because Christians have this strong sense that... um, a strong critique of religious laws. Not that we don't have a sense of law, but there's a sense that um, those need to be interpreted in current situations. And so uh, there's very few laws about eating, how you wear your hair, uh, whether you wear a beard, that Christians say are good for all time and places. So we'll say um, all things are lawful, but all things are not beneficial. That's a quote from Paul. And you need to figure out what to do in any time and place. So in terms of the hijab, it it comes and goes. But again, this is something that Muslims find problematic because it makes it sound like God changed God's mind. Right? Like one day I wanted you to wear the hijab and then I said, or or I wanted you to not eat pork. That's an easier one. Right? Don't eat pork. That's quite clear. Jews and Muslims are quite clear on that. Christians say that we come from Judaism, but we also claim that... uh, it's okay to have, you know, English and Scottish breakfasts. One final question, in, or I don't want to end on pork. Anybody? So, um, in the book of John, what Christians call the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus, um, has a, a lengthy prayer in which he says, I'm going to go to the Father, to God, um, but I'm going to send someone who is more powerful than I. Right? So for Christians, Christians interpret this as the Holy Spirit, God's e- eternal presence with us in the Holy Spirit. Uh, Muslims saw this text, and they said, no, what they're talking about is Muhammad. Right? From a Muslim's perspective, this seems like a really normal interpretation. For a Christian perspective, this seems, um, that's a totally American colloquialism, out of left field. Uh, You know, coming from nowhere, 
It doesn't make sense to us because we have our own traditions in which there's other stories in the Bible of the Spirit coming after Jesus leaves, of empowering people to do miracles, of empowering people to speak. Um, but for Muslims, this text is often thought of as a sign of, of Muhammad coming. What's that? Yeah. And so uh, uh, a, a helper or a, 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 a someone who empowers. Um, what's interesting is that if in the history of Christian Muslim debates, especially in the Arab world between like the 8th and the 14th century, this kept coming up. Muslims would bring this up as a, si as a sign that, you know, there, there's a prophecy and Christians would continually say, no, this is totally wrong. Um, I think one of the challenges is that not only do we have different texts and different theologies, we also have different histories of reading, right? Christians have the same thing where we have parts of the Old Testament that we say, this is clearly Jesus, right? The author is clearly talking about Jesus. Anyone with a right mind would see that this is Jesus. If you go ask a Jew how they read the text, they'll be like, you're crazy. There's no way this is Jesus. They're talking about, you know, a fifth century prophet. They're not talking about someone who comes 500 years later. Um, but learning, I think one of, the, one of the ways is not to give up on, on that, but to say, how do Christians interpret this text? Does it make sense or not? Um, and then you try to explain, this is how we see it. Um, it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be an either or of you saying, my way is the only way to read it. Are we done, Khalas? We can do yoga now, <laughs> I heard. Well, um, anyway, thank you all for inviting me. I have no idea um, whose idea it was. I think it was Joseph's. But I appreciate it, and I know it's a little all over the place, but we're trying to talk about 1,400 years of Christian-Muslim debates and diatribes, um, and I'm happy to, to chat afterwards or, or actually to chat at any time if you want to get away from George Square and go to the Divinity School, which has a much better building, especially with the construction out. So um, thank you all for having me.